on the spectrum. And so that gave a whole new meaning to um, the things that I used. I used to be um, specialized in disability um, even before I uh, had my personal experience. So meaning and personal experience are very uh, much tied together for me. Over to you. Thanks, Anique. Okay, Rachel. Morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Rachel. I'm from Perth, and I work um, in an organisation that supports people with disabilities. So, so my role is a mix of doing direct one-on-one -on -one support with clients, as well as um, some service coordination. Um, and the thing that pops to mind for me is, I guess, probably meaning and purpose being the thing that helps people with disabilities or without just anyone to have a life worth living. So yeah, that idea of living the good life. So yeah, thank you. Fabulous, thanks Rachel. Steve, at one o'clock in the morning, Steve. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Steve Easter and I'm in the UK. And um, I've walked, worked about uh, 40 or more years in services uh, for people with disabilities of one kind or another. I've also been parent of a young man who has considerable disabilities. Um, and I guess for me, um, I'm now working on a PhD about citizenship because I needed some meaning and purpose out of those 40 years to actually understand what on earth were we doing and how, how badly wrong were we getting it sometimes. So if for me, meaning and purpose matters that much, I guess when you have a lot of constraints around your life, um, you really need to have a, a sense that the things you're trying to do are, are crucial and central to your life. Fabulous, thanks Steve. Bridget? Uh, good morning, sorry I missed you last time. Um, I'm Bridget, I work in Perth in uh, an organisation that supports people with disabilities and I'm a training manager there. Um, and I think that for me, I'm really interested in this because it is complex enough to understand your own meaning and purpose on the planet and um, I'm not sure that I'm um, getting a chance to be able to explore that for the people that we support very well or support uh, support workers to find that for the people we support. That's me. Fabulous, thank you Bridget. Beth? Hello everyone, um, I've got a very shaky connection here so I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. Um, so I'm Bev and uh, I work at Aviva and um, we support many people with disabilities and for me the word meaning is um, about being able to wake up in the morning with a purpose and then you can give and share with others throughout the day. So very keen to be part of this session. Thanks Bev. Stephanie? Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm from Perth also, Perth people, and work for a peak organisation. And um, personally, um, meaning and purpose is like what gets me out of bed in the morning to you know start my day and, and get me moving. And I guess the other thing is what keeps me awake at night. So you know, it's looking at. Um, those synergies and I, and I like what you had to say Bridget around how to then to upskill, pass on that knowledge and um, that focus to the people that are doing the support work and um, yeah so I, I sort of had that connection with you on that one. Thanks Stephanie, okay, um, Jules. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jules. I um, live in Western Australia. Um, I also work for an organisation that supports people with disabilities and um, mental health issues. So that's where I, I sit at the moment. Um, I'm also at the moment studying social work. So one of my units this year is social inclusion and intellectual disabilities. So lots of learning happening for me. Um, 
I guess what comes to mind for me when I think about meaning and purpose is those things that, you know, make, make me feel alive and they add value to my life, but also then I feel, make me feel like I'm contributing to the world around me. So I have some significance and, and, and feeling that what I'm doing is adding value to my life and, and to other people's. Thanks, Kate. Fabulous. Thanks, Jules. Wendy Palmer? Hi everyone, I'm Wendy. Um, I also am in Western Australia in Perth and I um, work in an organisation that supports people with disabilities. My role is in uh, quality and uh, service design and so like some of the earlier um, people speaking, I'm quite curious about how we support staff to not be making assumptions about um, meaning and purpose and, and how to um, do that better in the workplace. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Kat Katrina and Lisa, we seem to have lost you. So um, let me know if I can help at all, if you can hear me, but um, we'll keep going. Alex? Hi guys, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. yeah good stuff. Um, my name is Alex. Um, I recently sort of um, started a business, a family business with my, uh, my dad, uh, working with adults and youth uh, who are at risk in the local community. Um, one of the things for me that's sort of um, important is just having them sort of targets and goals in my life so that it gives me some form of direction. I just feel a little bit lost without the without having goals and targets in my life. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Cool, thanks, Alex. Okay, Wendy O'Meara, um, we can't see you, so if you want to turn your video on, it's down in the left-hand corner. If not, can you can you hear us and can, can we... Right. Yeah, okay. I can absolutely hear you, and I can now... Yeah, cool, there's the video. Brilliant, hello. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a bit late coming in. That's okay, no worries. Sorry. So we're just doing a check-in, Wendy, which is just who we are, what's our connection, and how come we're here, and what comes up for you when you think about the topic for today, meaning and purpose. Okay, so um, I'm working here in New Zealand in the Manawhai Kaha prototype in Palmerston North, um, enabling good lives, and historically have been involved for many, many years in local area coordination in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I guess for me, I think a lot of my participation here is also being able to take the messages and the purposes of the, um, the whole webinar series back to a team of relatively new people who are working here alongside families in the new prototype. So an education and formative process um, for myself um, in a leadership role here within this team. Thanks, Wendy. Dee, I don't know, I know you're having difficulties with the camera. Are you able to talk to us or not? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Dee, yes, we can. Awesome, yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure about the issue. Um, hopefully next time we'll get organised. Um, yeah, I'm a, work for a DSO, you know, provider, so I guess when I think of purpose, it comes down to goals and dreams and, like Alex said, that direction, but, um, and just having that little bit of satisfaction in life, that feeling of achievement. And then I guess building on from someone previously said, the desire to keep challenge yourself, that, that drive. So something that's forever changing, I guess, as well. Okay, fabulous. Thanks, Dee. Silvana? Hi, I'm Sil uh, Silvana uh, Marmik. Um, I'm here because I'm a mum of a young man, uh, three boys, but um, my, young, uh, my eldest actually has a disability, 28 years old. Um, that's, um, that's my... Um, Purpose and meaning uh, in my work life is I run an organisation that supports children with disabilities in their families. And I've sort of combined that sort of sense of um, learning from my own experience and sharing with other families through my work. It gives me a lot of meaning and sense of purpose, uh, as well as a lot of support. And um, I'm just um, delighted that um, I've been invited today to talk to this international group of people on this important topic. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Savannah. Michael? So you're muted, Michael? That's it. Yeah, I'm still getting used to this technology, so. 
Uh, I'm uh, Michael Kendrick. I'm uh, at the moment, I'm in New Zealand, uh, but I'm usually based in the US. Um, and uh, I, uh, I've been involved uh, in the sector for oh, over four decades. Uh, and uh, a lot of that work has been in public speaking and evaluation and things like that. So I, I've uh, had long had an interest in these sorts of issues. So, and uh, I write about them actually quite a bit. Just a bit. Um, okay, thanks, Michael. And then Katrina? And I've just tried to unmute you, Katrina, but um, no, we're having trouble with that? Yeah, we're having trouble. Oh, here. no, we've got you. We've got you. Oh, Can you hear you? Good. So sorry, I missed the question. We're having problems with the audio. So, so just who you are, your connection um, to this, this program and what comes up for you when you think about meaning and purpose, which is today's topic. Okay, so I'm uh, working for Avivo here in Western Australia along with Kate. Um, I think I, I'm very interested in citizenship. I think it actually drives the work that we do with the people that we support here. And meaning and purpose is probably one of the most fundamental challenges that we face when trying to um, help people explore what it is that they want for their lives. It's, it's very easy to link people into housing and it's very easy to uh, help in other ways, but helping somebody find their true meaning and purpose and something that makes them feel joyful about their life is probably one of the biggest challenges we face. Fabulous. Thanks, Katrina. And I think that's everybody other than myself. So like I've said, I'm Kate, I work at Avivo alongside some people who are here. And I also uh, have taken on the role of Citizen Network Facilitator for Australia. Um, and um, yeah, just dead excited about the topic. I think I echo everything that's been said, just feels so fundamental to uh, hu human condition, really. So really excited. So I'm going to hand over to Silvana. And um, please just let me know if you want me to do anything, put people in rooms, do whatever. But um, yeah, over to you. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, just again to uh, remind those who joined a little later that today's going to be an interactive session. Uh, there's a little chat bo uh, box down on the bottom of the page. If, um, if you've got an idea, uh, pop it into the chat box and Kate will, will draw it to our attention. Um, if you can also see a little raise hand button, uh, you could do that in Zoom. And that's another way that you can get our attention if you'd like to interrupt. And Kate will, Kate will see that and hand, hand over uh, to you to make a comment. But if you do neither of those, uh, there'll be two sections in today's um, discussion where we've planned uh, for, for a breakout room. So Kate's going to facilitate that. And at the, at the time that we get to that part, I'll ask a question and Kate will organise us into little virtual rooms and we can have a, a, a breakout conversation and then bring back um, a key point to our um, bigger conversation, broader conversation. So uh, Kate, I just also wanted to say thank you to Citizen uh, Network, um, both the international and for you uh, for um, being the Australian or Australasian representative. I'm not sure how you're terming <laughs> yourself. And, and for getting this conversation started uh, down here in the Southern Hemisphere. And thanks to all the international uh, guests for, for joining us today for this conversation as well. So what, uh, what we thought would happen in the next um, sort of say 20 minutes or half an hour is that uh, I will ask um, uh, our guest Michael uh, uh, three questions and um, one by one, I won't ask all, all at once Michael, and um, we'll get Michael to give, um, you know, as, as an individual who spends a lot of time thinking, writing and talking about this internationally, but also as Michael said, has been thinking and talking and writing about this for 40 years, that's a hell of a long time. Um, we'll get Michael to sort of talk uh, to each question for about five minutes. Uh, again, if something springs to mind, pop it in the chat box. Um, I, I guess uh, I'll come in at the end of um, those three questions and talk a little bit about what meaning and purpose means for families of very little children with disabilities and their families. Um, then we'll um, break up into, we'll ask a question. Um, Kate will break you up into little groups um, and that, that will happen for two questions. We'll have a little bit more of a conversation when we get back together after those two questions as well. We'll continue the conversation as permitting and then at the end, uh, close to the end of the hour and a half, Kate will bring us all together again and, and recap and, and end off the webinar. So uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, it's wonderful to be talking to you all. Um, Michael, um, the first question is, what does it mean to have a life with meaning? <laughs> Well, it's uh, very important to uh, 
take that question as an individual question uh, because <clears throat> it's a very personal question, uh, the, whether your life has meaning. And uh, in this respect, the different people would have different answers to what brings meaning into their life. So it's, uh, for, for most people, it's a bit of a dilemma because uh, uh, one isn't born with a list of all the things that are meaningful to you. You kind mm -hmm. of discover them by living. And uh, so it's often the case that people are confused about what is meaningful uh, and what makes life meaningful. Uh, and uh, it's quite possible to make the wrong decisions about your life, uh, thinking it is the right decision. So uh, I think anybody that's a bit um, unsure of themselves is actually paying attention. Um, meaning is, a, people often, call it a, a search for meaning. And the word search is a very good word because uh, uh, meaning isn't self-evident always. Uh, it is something we do discover and we, it is also something that uh, is elusive. Um, and uh, things that we, for instance, used to find very meaningful, we may find that aren't that meaningful anymore. So we've moved on in life and we found new meaning in new things. Uh, and at the same time, there might be things that remain meaningful throughout one's life uh, that uh, don't go away. So this is the complexity of meaning. It's, uh, it's not a straightforward uh, question at all. Uh, and uh, they, uh, there's always seems to be another layer to it, at least in my experience. Uh, so uh, if one looked at life as a series of discoveries, um, then uh, you just never know what the next discovery that is meaningful to you is going to be. Michael, um, you know, whenever, whenever I listen to you, you make it sound so simple, but I guess that's what comes from 40 years of thinking about this. You've uh, really been able to distill some of those ideas into just the most beautiful little little nuggets um, discovered by living, permission to make mistakes and, and learn through living, and um, and then uh, you know searching and uh, and uh, experiencing. You know, it just sounds so deceptively simple. Um, Michael, why should we think about having a life with meaning? Well, because uh, our lives uh, um, are are important, and. Uh, Finding meaning is is a way in which it it, it, it kind of anchors our lives, and uh, when people don't have a sense of meaning, uh, they feel quite lost. So meaning it gives us a, a direction, or some people call it purpose in life, uh, and a reason to get up every morning, as some have said already, uh, and a reason to. Uh, to live a particular kind of life. Uh, and, uh, and so it really, I mean, almost goes to the question of why were you born in the first place? And uh, why are you here? And where do you think you're going while you're here? And uh, there might even be questions like, where are you going when you're not here? Uh, so these are all aspects of meaning. Uh, and it's, it's not that meaning is a singular thing. It's actually you can have meaning in different parts of your life. Uh, for instance, in your emotional life and in your relationships, uh, in your life interests and passions, in the identity you've chosen for yourself, in your heritage and language and culture. Uh, there can even be meaning in one's limitations and one's failings uh, as much as one's uh, achievements and uh, one's roles. And of course, uh, it's, uh, it, there's meaning even in the gifts that we have, uh, that we have going for us. Uh, and, and many have said that uh, they found great meaning in, uh, in their shortcomings. Um, so if, if you give yourself permission to see meaning as having a, being a many-sided reality, uh, and it helps deal with the complexity of uh, who we are and the 
the varying sources of meaning that we might have in our life. Uh, I've just um, I've just pulled up a uh, visual of the keys to citizenship because, of course, this webinar series is really coming at um, exploring the keys to citizenship uh, model. And uh, it occurred to me, Michael, while you were talking there, that um, what brings people meaning and purpose could be a range of different things is what I, what I heard you saying. And, um, and it just made me think about the keys to citizenship illustration, the little um, infographic. And purpose, um, purpose and meaning, I'm looking at an older one, it just says purpose on the middle, um, is the central um, hexagon, I think it is. And around that is love, freedom, money, home, help and life. And as you were talking, I just had a little moment where I thought, of course, this may have occurred to all of you previously who have been thinking about this um, issue for a lot longer that what brings us um, individually meaning might be any one of those things. It might be love, freedom, money, home, help, life, and whatever that means for us individually, whether we have a disability or don't have a disability. And in the last episode or the first, um, the first webinar series, what really struck me uh, with um, Simon's um, talk was how universal the citizenship concept is and the fact that it is universal is probably extremely powerful in terms of a feature of why it works for people with disabilities because it's not something separate it's something that brings so much meaning um, uh, you know and, and sort of has a sense of um, purpose for everyone not just those with disabilities and that in fact strengthens it as a concept um, but uh, if you get a chance to take a look at that little uh, infographic or maybe we'll be able to pop it up later on the screen and, and share it so Michael um, if uh, so, we've, we've now heard from you about why have a, a, a life with uh, meaning, and that might meet, be different to everybody else. And you've taken it into the next realm and thought, here we are, and well, we're alive, and what brings meaning, and what might bring meaning after we're no longer here. Um, how do we, bringing it back to the uh, the worldly uh, context, how do we um, have a life with meaning? And what I'd, I'd ask you here, Michael, is for some perspective around where your your sort of um, expertise really lies in terms of talking with uh, people about what a life with meaning means for people with disabilities, in fact, um, specifically adults with disabilities. Well, I think uh, people often use the term the good life, uh, and the good life is the life that is uh, fulfilling for a particular person. And uh, the, the things that are fulfilling uh, may not matter so much, uh, because they are different from one person to another. But to be able to find the things that are fulfilling uh, is, is really the challenge, to have the, the things that you find fulfilling, to have them present in your life. And many people find themselves unhappy because something that is fulfilling isn't present in their life. And so they feel a sense of loss or disappointment or discouragement. And so uh, they, uh, the, the, I think there's as much in meaning in terms of uh, not finding uh, meaning as there is in finding it. Because uh, a lot of us spend time in, in a world where the meaning, uh, we, we, we're searching for it uh, because it's not present in our life at that, at that particular time. Now, people do find things that are eventually that are fulfilling um, and that are almost, if you like, their calling or what they were born to do. Uh, but uh, not everybody's that fortunate. So there are people that f find uh, meaning quite elusive and life satisfaction quite elusive, or at least at periods in their life. And, and so uh, I think it's, it's both a blessing to have meaning in your life, but it's also um, it can be a, a challenge because uh, it, not everything we do, do we find it to be meaningful. And it's a bit like if you had a job that you really didn't like and it didn't suit you and, and uh, you'd be frustrated with life because you're, you want a job that suits you and that you'd find fulfilling, but you may not be able to get that job. Uh, and so you're, there's a big gap or a, a uh, an emptiness in your life and a dissatisfaction. So meaning uh, is entwined with uh, 
really for a lot of people a search for the ingredients of life that work best for them and then uh, cultivating those ingredients if it's a, possible to do that. And in many cases, people want to be true to who they are. So that's another whole dimension of this, this, uh, you know, be, li living the authentic life is living the life that's really you, uh, that where you're true to yourself. Um, so this is a, often a conversation with, that a person has with themselves about meaning. Uh, and life satisfaction and maybe the frustrations and uh, setbacks in life is what, what to make, how to make sense of them so that you can, uh, you know, you can find some way forward. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that often isn't uh, present. Uh, there isn't at a particular moment in time a way forward on some issues. And so uh, people have to endure uh, circumstances that are uh, don't make sense or that are thwarting their happiness. Uh, and uh, you have to make sense of that. You have to figure out, well, why? Why is this happening? And what can I do about it? So I think, um, uh, I think the idea of uh, finding meaning and finding life satisfaction is uh, a very complicated challenge uh, for people. And yet, you know, when you see, you talk to people, you find all kinds of people are reasonably, they find their lives reasonably meaningful. They are reasonably satisfied. Uh, they're grateful, in fact, for much of what they have in their life. And yet, if you listen to some of the difficulties they've had, you'd think, well, how can you be so happy, you know, with all the challenges that you've had to face? And yet people somehow find meaning, happiness, and fulfillment nonetheless. So um, uh, that's a bit of a puzzle. Michael, you've traveled around the world. Where have you, you know, where have you seen sort of this done well, search for meaning? You know, a lot of us here today are working in the disability sector and we're here on the conversation to really explore and deepen our understanding of these concepts and how we can use them to inform, um, you know, better service design or being a more responsive organisation or being a better, a better partner as a professional in working with people with disabilities, their families, carers and others. Uh, you know, what have you, what have you seen that, that you can sort of say, here are some tips and where is it done well? Well, I think uh, people like to be doing something that's consonant with their values. Uh, so uh, people are most satisfied when they're true to their, their beliefs and their values. Uh, and where they can live those values, they're much, generally much happier. And some of the difficulties around people with disabilities is that the, the way people treat people with disabilities, the way they support them and so on may be inconsistent with our principles and values. And uh, that, that creates a, almost a conflict between our values and the kinds of realities that we uh, see in uh, people's lives and have to engage and in many cases uh, transcend and repair uh, all the hurt that might have been done to people. So I think uh, that people are happiest when they're, if you like, when they're being person-centered and where they can be uh, uh, sort of truly helpful to somebody else. Uh, and uh, feel like they're living those uh, values and those principles. Uh, it wouldn't matter too much that, uh, you know, that, uh, that we don't always live up to our values uh, because that would be unusual to be absolutely coherent. But I think when I say uh, true to your values is that in, in most of the time you're, you're living according to your standards and your principles, even if you do fall short uh, here and there. Michael, before I say a few words, I just am um, curious, uh, one of the things that you've said a couple of times is, um, you know, learning 
through living, discovering, um, not finding our, our, our sense of purpose and meaning immediately is actually just as valuable as finding the meaning. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Because what I hear you saying there is what's important is that getting out and experiencing life and or cr as service providers to help people feel confident enough or to help them to create those experiences to discover and learn without the pressure of feeling like making mistakes is a failure, but it's actually a part of the whole experience itself. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Well, I think um, it's, uh, if you looked at life as uh, that we're here to learn, um, we've certainly got lots to learn. And so I think one of the ways is to be a, a good student of life by uh, getting the learnings uh, that are in front of us and uh, to see everything as a kind of a teaching uh, would be a very good way to look at it that, uh, you know, because even being in very complicated, unsatisfying situations can actually be uh, ways in which we develop insight and uh, insight and uh, clarity about, uh, about the meaning of events. And we also uh, learn uh, the, something about the nature of our limitations and the reality that we can make a difference. Uh, and yet, uh, if we are to make a difference, we must face often very substantial challenges. So uh, I think the framework I would put around it would be that uh, if, uh, if we could think about a life and meaning as a, a search for um, uh, learning and growth, um, then uh, no, no experience is going to be wasted, even unpleasant ones. Uh, totally, uh, uh, that's taken the conversation to it about the search for meaning to another profound level, uh, Michael. It just um, helps to illustrate to me how useful these, the, the um, keys to citizenship concept is. It just has got a lot of meaning for me, um, I don't have a disability, again, so universal and, and what an awesome opportunity for people with disabilities, their families and carers to be able to kind of uh, access the kinds of um, uh, experiences and opportunities to learn through their life uh, and the focus really there on creating a steady stream of experiences and the emphasis is not or the aim is not so much about it creating you know the measures of success or removing every single risk from every one of those opportunities but allowing people to explore and and discover and uh, and find out who, who um, you know who they are and um, from my own perspective um, um, Michael, you, uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to have a few breakfast, lunches and dinners and, and enjoy these kinds of conversations with you and to, to learn from the insights that you've gained over the years of thinking about these things and just reflecting back on my experience as a, a mum of a young man now who... Um, who since leaving high school has explored uh, using his individualized funding, explored life, um, made mistakes, um, and uh, you know enjoyed uh, making those uh, in, in a way uh, to help, as you say, to find what things he is interested in. He doesn't communicate verbally, and just allowing him the opportunity to experience as much as he can. Um, to sort of find out who he is as a person and, and, and to experience that young adulthood into adulthood stage with that sort of coming of age experience, just like any other young adult would. Again, a very universal experience, something that I'd expect all, you know, my other children to experience and would, what we'd expect all young people to do in that kind of coming of age experience. The challenge, I guess, is from my perspective, um, working with very young children um, and parents of those children who are birth to eight years old in in the 20 plus years uh, that I've been working in, in this organization in the early childhood intervention sector is about how to how to help families to focus on the things that matter and uh, at, a, at a time in particular where their focus is quite particularly on eat drink walk talk you know the fundamentals of getting things right for their son or daughter understanding what what kind of a life is ahead for their child uh, and all of that happens in the noise of you know diagnosis uh, and um, you know medical options and uh, therapy and you know goals that are therapeutic or developmental in nature and so uh, one, of, one of the challenges um, that I've uh, faced 
learning from you and other um, others who are very experienced in in and thinking and and uh, talking about these things throughout your entire careers is how do I bring that conversation and that um, that awareness to parents of very little children uh, something that you said and I think that was echoed in last week uh, the first webinar was um, th you know the search for meaning is a search a search a discovery and a process that we do through living and so some of the messages that I'm trying to deliver to families of very little children are precisely, so start thinking about those right now because we don't wake up one day when your son or daughter is 18 and suddenly that they or we have kind of gone, yep, we get a sense of what meaning they have in their life. Uh, and it strikes me that what happens during childhood is that somehow or another, what, what, how we're supporting families of very little children or throughout childhood is really in this sort of perhaps um, sort of learning by accident, uh, where there's no kind of real um, uh, attempts, I don't think, strategic, strategically or investment in helping families, who I believe are the first um, teachers of their children and who are actually in control and a part of their child's life for, you know, at least until 18. Uh, they've got a significant um, potential to influence the direction of their son or daughter's future and the challenge is about how to help them start to think about those things as a as possible, in, in my view, uh, is to sort of take what we're talking about today and to try to um, present that and package that in ways so that it is relevant and important to families so that they start paying attention to these issues, which are so fundamental, but can often seem esoteric or not now, you know, today I'm, I'm managing with a child's behaviour in the shopping centre or I can't feed my child or I'm cleaning up toileting accidents. And so life sort of it's almost like life gets in the way uh, of families thinking about these things early. But I think connecting that with what you said is what we're doing is finding meaning through the everyday and through living. That's where we find mm -hmm. meaning. How mm -hmm. to help families to pay attention uh, to that is really something that I have um, tried to uh, focus on. And I wanted to just tell a little story that um, it didn't, um, it wasn't really clear to me how the keys to citizenship was um, helpful for families of very little children because uh, I'd, um, despite my personal experience, I'd um, had an assumption, a quite dangerous assumption, that this was too esoteric as a framework for parents of very little children. And um, Kate, you and uh, Simon uh, presented a couple of days as a workshop, I think last year or it could have been the year before, here in Sydney. Um, and you were talking about the keys to citizenship and um, somehow or another I'd um, made a um, decision to encourage two peer workers at Plumtree who are parents of very little children. One's daughter is six, it was a father, and another was at the time I think four years old. And um, because they were employees of the organisation I run, I thought I'm going to just direct them to attend this workshop on citizenship and the keys to citizenship. And um, at the time I was very um, tentative about it because I thought uh, you know, how do we present this message to families and get them to notice that this is important, they should start directing some of their very important attention and time and planning uh, to this from the very earliest possible point. But at the same time, I was sceptical that it was just, you know, maybe perhaps not relevant enough or too esoteric for them. And of course, um, my, um, my perceptions and my beliefs were sort of really um, proven wrong. And um, the two parents that attended as peer workers, I joined on the second day for, um, uh, I think for part of the day or most of the day on the second day of the workshop. And I was just astounded at how much the keys to citizenship model and the search for meaning had for parents of these um, two very little children. And I think what I, uh, what I got out of that um, after exploring uh, this with my, um, my, my co close colleague, Anik, uh, in New Zealand and both of us are also mothers and, and she said why did it surprise you because what parents really want for their child even before they perhaps even know that their child has been born there's this perception that we want our child to have a certain type of future and that's a type of future that um, that really links in with having a life of, of meaning and, and whatever brings that meaning to our children, we're kind of expecting that they'll figure that out as they go along. But that our role as parents is that we have these expectations for a wonderful future for our sons or daughters. And I remember Anik saying, 
that's what the keys to citizenship model actually is based on. You can get some meaning out of it yourself as an adult and, uh, and a parent, but also isn't that what we all want as parents of our children? And of course, yes, but somehow or another, I'd kind of seen this as a model that perhaps wasn't meeting the immediate needs of families, but I was certainly proven wrong. So my, my work um, with Anik has been on how we can um, talk to families and alert them to how important this is in the very earliest possible points uh, of their of their life and help them offer uh, help to offer them direction uh, to really pay attention and to make this conversation relevant and appropriate for them uh, in in regards to their very little children and I'll say a little bit more about that later in terms of what is a meaningful life for a very young child uh, but right now um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get your talking. Oh, I see a chat. <laughs> Sorry, Silvana. So I'm just uh, interrupting there. So for whatever reason, the group breakout is not working in this channel. Um, so I'm not able to do it. So I think we're going to have to have a conversation as a bigger group. Because um, the only other way I can do it is to, for us all to log out and come back in, which I think that would be a just, we won't do that. So, yeah, I can't put people into groups today for whatever reason. Um, so your question for that you were going to pose to us in smaller groups, yes. is, is there a way that we could have a conversation? I mean, I'm just wondering, Silvana, before we go to the question, whether based on what you and Michael have been talking about, I'm just curious about where that's taken people's thinking. Oh. So, kind of, you know, what's popping up for you um, in in the last 15, 20 minutes, yeah, in your context and, yeah, where that takes your thinking, because I'm sure you'll have a perspective. Um, any thoughts, anybody? So, Jen? Um, I kind of wanted to um, uh, say thank you, Silvana, for that um, story that you just shared, is that um, where it came for me is I've been an OT for 30 years working with families and children with um, uh, autism spectrum disorders. And I guess coming to where I am at the moment, I'm in this place of thinking, um, how do we get the message to families, to young families, that it's not therapy that's the answer, it's just an additional kind of part and that um, that notion around uh, having friends and being uh, a, a, a person who can navigate the environment you know having friends um, is the conversation I want to be having with families right at the beginning so it kind of absolutely resonated with me is that um, and, for, and I'm, I'm terrified that the NDIS is uh, putting everything back into uh, therapists making judgment and there's uh, uh, not so skilled, there's very young and not so skilled therapists out there and I kind of feel like um, I'm frightened for families that they're going to be told that therapy is so important when mm -hmm. what I've discovered after 30 years of provision of therapy is it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks Bridget. Yeah, so, uh, and Bridget, it's so important that you to make your comments now and in continuation to what Silvana says, um, Oh, you know, we cannot overstate the importance of early intervention to, for families to understand this as early as possible. Um, it doesn't seem to me from an outsider that the NDIS is really focused on that. Uh, so maybe we can uh, do something to, to make a point there so that all the experts that, that are taking decisions um, funnel resources or you know whatever it is that that's going to make that uh, and at the same time um, as everyone was talking and, and talking about the the way that they understand meaning it's in the fact that meanings are changing and and uh, and the importance of the keys of citizenship um, are, is different and different parts of, of one's life and they play different roles and so really it's 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 about being very um, conscious of what happens all the time i hate to say here and now but uh, you know because things are changing all the time and so really the only thing that's important at this point is the present you know how things are going yes we need to understand the past yes we need to plan for the future but that's what it brings to me at the moment just you've asked for a general comment so the importance of the present present because everything is changing so rapidly 
and the importance also of, of and wh why I'm saying this is because we also have amongst us and of course in society people who have already children that are older with disabilities. So yeah, importance of early intervention and then at the same time taking care of everything else that, you know, if things didn't happen that way for people who, when, they, when their children were developing or when themselves were growing up, how do we now make this point, bring this point forward, that particular learning that Bridget is talking about? Thank you. Thanks, Anik. Any other thoughts? I have a question for Silvana and Michael and everybody else. Um, so one of the things that keeps coming up for me while you were both talking is how profoundly personal the search for meaning is. So, um, so yeah, how, and it's, I'm quite um, overwhelmed by it actually, how profoundly personal it is and how when we're walking alongside people, whoever that may be, you know, people with a disability, friends, family, um, how we do that in a way that has little judgment in it. Because my experience of being a family member as well, and a, a human being myself, is that my search for meaning at, at different points in my life, it, it's so laden with, because it's so profoundly personal, it's so laden with judgment, mm -hmm. that um, I, I, I'm now concerned that, are people even able to really explore it? Because there is a kind of expectation on who we should be and how we should be. Um, yeah, and uh, so I don't know if that's even a very well-formed question. I suppose I'm curious about it. People who certainly rely on assistance, how we do that in a way that respects the personal journey, but also kind of really promotes that. I don't know, have you got any thoughts about that? Well, uh, I think uh, you can't avoid judgment. It's built into our nature that we come to various judgments. Um, and some of our judgments are not fair to other people. And, uh, and, and we regret them. But judgment's probably unavoidable. It's part of the, you know, the human experience. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know anybody that says that their, their judgments are are good all the time. So maybe there's some hidden benefit or silver lining in the fact that sometimes our, our bad judgments are our greatest teacher. Because we learned uh, that, oh, how could I have been so wrong? And how could I be so prejudiced or whatever it was that was not very flattering to us. Um, so it's hard to think about making a fool of yourself as educational but it just may be that uh, it is educational in the long run because it raises our consciousness about uh, our human nature and its limitations. And it, on the other side of some of that might be more compassion for yourself and for others because we all uh, you know, make poor judgments. And uh, so maybe the wisdom of it is that we, uh, we realize that we just simply have to forgive others uh, theirs and hope that they'll forgive us ours. Uh, I'll, I'll get, uh, Michael's always uh, theoretical and philosophical and, I'll, philosophical and I'll get practical. Um, you know, Michael, what you just said, um, uh, in terms of a practical experience working with families of very little children, you said compassion, uh, wisdom, and, um, and then the, you know, the experience uh, I, I immediately thought of peer uh, power and how, how enormously is important it is for families to be able to be connected to other, I'm talking about families of very little children, to be connected to other parents who are in a similar situation. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're trying to explore here in, in New South Wales is how do we help families of very little children to see the, the purpose and power potential of connecting with other parents because Bridget as you said in those early stages pe people are getting messaging around the, um, the importance and the critical nature of intervention and by that I think people typically interpret that particularly in Australia right now as um, therapeutic interventions or educational or developmental interventions and um, 
And so some of the work that we're trying to focus on is how to change that narrative and to create um, uh, impetus through a knowledgeable and capable uh, peer network and how, um, you know, Michael, your conversations with me over the years um, and Anik has led us to be more confident that one of the things that will enable peer networks to do that and stay on track with doing that is to uh, work on a family leadership model and to invest and build family leadership. Uh, whether you, you, you talk um, quite a lot about leadership, meaning different things to different uh, individuals and certainly in the context of working with, working with families of very little children accepting and embracing that leadership can be leadership in my family leadership with my child uh, it could be leadership in my local community at my local um, soccer ch children's mainstream soccer club it could be leadership at my child's local school where I'm supporting the inclusion of my child that will then uh, open the doors for other children either there or, or yet to come, or it could be leadership in its other more sort of um, uh, typical forms in terms of leading groups or leading organisations or having a, a, a greater public voice in terms of promoting some of what I think are these messages that we need to give a voice to a large number of families. There needs to be some momentum built around that and that we think that that momentum will drive from the community um, a, a, a sort of a groundswell bridge to address the kinds of problems that are um, becoming more cemented in Australia in particular, in terms of what matters. Uh, earlier, you um, talked about Michael focus. And I think for me, the message is, what are we telling families and how, what investment is happening in helping families to focus on the right things, those things that matter to children, um, you know, meaning, purpose, what does that mean for families of very little children, um, relationships, friendships, um, but, you know, having a, um, having a place in their family with their sibling or their, um, their you know, have strong, strong relationships with their parents, uh, those things can't be taken for granted, their neighbourhood, um, you know, family and, and friends, extended family, uh, apart, apart, you know, play, um, a, a right to be in um, environments with other little children their age doing the things that those children do so that they're they're to me the kind of more important questions that I think we could come at with parents using the keys to citizenship model and um, you know it certainly um, does uh, needs more attention and investment but I think that working through family leadership uh, is certainly a really important strategy to create stronger peer networks and then to allow those conversations to happen through really strong um, uh, peer networks. Um, my colleague uh, Anik has also been doing some research in providing, so for me the um, idea about promoting this with families of very little children then gives them the tools and, and understanding, hopefully um, within a peer network, to do, to to raise their children, um, you know, through living, uh, not being afraid of making mistakes as a parent, but to start early so that they're not expecting their son or daughter to start living at the age of 18 when they leave high school and then start that journey of discovery and of meaning um, at 18. But I think that parents with some um, support and, and, and attention could be, you know, resources could be doing this at a much younger stage. And the purpose really is about empowering then the family to recognize and your role is to now give voice to your son or daughter and that doesn't have to happen when they turn 18 that doesn't have to happen um you know whether or not they can speak or not speak and it's got nothing to do with the nature of the level of their disability but that your son or daughter's voice matters and last um webinar uh, Wendy said something uh, that uh, was profound and uh, Anika repeated it and said, we have to listen. So when you say, let's listen, before listening is the expectation that that individual has something to say. And I think for many parents and myself included, I went through my son's childhood and high school and I don't know that I really paid enough attention to what is my son telling me? 
And I think before you listen, you've actually got to expect that someone has got something to say. And my son uh, doesn't talk. And, uh, and I think that for me now, um, some work that Anik is doing uh, in New Zealand uh, in partnership with um, the CCS Disability Action and some local schools is uh, a project on amplifying youth voice. Uh, because to me, we need to start planting that seed immediately with families of very little children so that they start proactively start looking for ways to nurture and nourish their child's search for meaning through the keys approach and give their child a voice as soon as possible. Anik, did you want to sort of give an example of something that's come out of that research? Yeah, um, I actually was looking forward to uh, telling Simon this uh, because uh, we're sort of ha halfway through the research and we haven't yet uh, been able to write write the results up uh, significantly, but so there's certain things that are popping up, and um, you know we were looking at how do we get conversations at a much earlier age happening uh, with uh, young people in sort of the late teens and early adulthood, and uh, in order to find out from them uh, what um, will give meaning to their life and. Um, so the, what you're referring to, Silvana, is when Wendy uh, said um, you need to listen to people. Um, I, I was asking the question before, uh, is there, you know, to Simon, does he recommend any tools uh, for, for working this way? As Bridget was saying before, uh, how do we support, how do we train support people not to make these assumptions? So therefore, and it, it's very Tough, tough question, actually, because the, you know, common sense says, if you want to know what people want, ask them, right? I mean, does anyone have anything against that? And yet, conversation is time, proving time and again to betray the listener and the talker very much so, because we don't have easy access, you know, like, you know, what's the meaning of life or what do I want now? What are my goals? We don't have easy access to these things at all, at all level of consciousness. Um, Bridget, you're smiling. I'm, I'm curious to hear your reaction to that. And so um, what happened is um, we developed a, a tool through the Keys to Citizenship, uh, we're very visual with some images so that people can react to these images, verbal or nonverbal. And um, so just quickly, one, inst one uh, you know, uh, story to report is uh, a young man who was uh, using a, a, a wheelchair that was particularly big because of his, uh, he has many, many um, physical disabilities. He has uh, a little speech, but it's very hard to understand. So we need to all focus and listen to, to when he talks. But um, he just picked up on a, so this, uh, um, 16 year old has been in high school already for two years in the same high school and I have seen the, the stuff that works with him and I thought that they were great they do listen they uh, you know anything that you possibly would want uh, was there on the ground and so when he saw a picture with a group of young people he said that what he wanted was uh, he, he's in mainstream in sociology class and he said, what I want is, I, I want to contribute to the discussion, you know, like part of being the citizenship. I want to contribute and I want people to talk to me. And there was a deep shock in the room at the time when he was saying this because everyone thought that, you know, well, we've, we've already tried everything we can to uh, help him achieve his goals. And yet, uh, the fact that his big wheelchair was, stuck at, at the next to the entrance of the room and not with the other children that didn't seem to make you know to be a problem for either the the people that were supporting him or even him until uh, until certain things came about in this exercise with the keys to citizenship and um so uh, just to quickly to say, you know, luckily because it was a sociology class, we, you know, the, he managed to actually tell the teacher and the teacher who is a you know, smart, whoa, this is sociology. We could actually turn this around and make the, the reason why they couldn't do this is because there was a rule at the school that you leave a, a classroom the way you found it. So because the classroom was not, you know, the only place for the wheelchair was 
uh, next to the room, next to the door, because it was organized like this. But hey, the sociology teacher understood that he could grab that at that moment and turn it into a, a, a potentially life-changing event for everyone in the class to understand that for months they had had one of their peers sitting at the, at the door there and, and to contribute. So that, that luckily was, you know, was, um, you know, through the citizenship uh, toolbox, we were able to bring this about and make everyone, um, you know, get, for everyone to gain that. Bridget, what, I'm curious, uh, both Bridget and Steve, I saw your reactions. What were you thinking? Get into that? Yeah, here I am. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I, I was interested. Somebody said a bit Which earlier. Still about, awake? Pardon? Yeah, I'm still awake. Yeah. Um, about um, often for families with, with children, um, young children in particular, you know, that life gets in the way. But actually, the whole thing is life is the way. <laughs> And that it's actually about observing and, and, and seeing what is going on in everyday life. Because even some of the most profoundly disabled children I've worked with have actually been trying to tell us things and we haven't been getting it. Uh, they may have done it in challenging behavior. They may have just done it in that little look or in that, or, or, or whatever it was. But, but there's a lot more capacity we, we have really to understand and, and, and look for clues about what is actually important for, for people. The ones that would worry me now the most in the UK would be uh, for those families where it's not life getting in the way, but austerity is actually stopping them having any life. Um, but that's, you know, there's, there's so much we can just learn by being with people in, in life, you know, we've all been out with a friend somewhere and they've suddenly said something surprising. And you thought, oh, I didn't know about that. I didn't even think they cared about that. And that's the same for the, the children and young people we work with. Um, Anik, I think the reason I smiled is that it feels like at the moment there's a bit of a collision going on with this conversation in the um, Citizen Network um, uh, uh, conversation, but also some stuff that we're trying to do with support staff around listening and trying to beat out this notion of non-verbal. So in actual fact, tomorrow I meet with a team. I guess this is where I think speeches have something to offer is around, sorry, that's that sounded dreadful. I think speeches have a lot to offer, but this this other part around, um, you know, the, the complexity and quality of communication does not actually happen only in language and that notion around sharing emotions or feelings or having something to say and getting people to tune into that. that that's when, when you started talking, it just kind of felt like uh, a few things are coming together for me all at the same time. So thank you. Mm -hmm. and I'm curious about, um, I know that there are some people on the call who, whose context is very different to working with young families. And I suppose I'm thinking around people who are supporting people uh, around their recovery journey. And um, I, 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 I'm really curious about your perspective, because I think it's a, a very different perspective, but where this might be taking your thinking. Because certainly for me, Silvana, when you said to listen, you need to have an expectation that people have got something to say, I can absolutely see in the context of walking alongside people and their recovery, how that can be really overseen. You know, it can be, uh, yeah, profoundly overseen, I, I think. So I, I know that you don't have to talk, but I know there are some people who that's what you do, that's what you're immersed in. Has, has this come, where's this conversation taken your thinking? Because it's a totally different context. Jules? Yeah, I just, you know, listening to Michael about a, a, a life of meaning and, and it's about the process of, of living and, and it's those experiences that happen to us. Um, and I, I think about some of the people that I'm working with at the moment and each day really is about 
often about survival and medication and fighting to have a voice with, um, you know, medical services. Um, where's the opportunity then for those people to have those experiences that get them looking outside of that little funnel that they're in? Um, and, you know, I guess in terms of, of me and, and my role, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough in that area? You know, to help them see outside themselves, mm. so to speak, um, because it's easy to get caught up in the funnel with them. Um, and I, I think too, you know, for people with disabilities, it, I can imagine that life is often very confining. So, you know, are we are we putting life? Are we putting life in the way of people as much as we can? Thanks, Judy. Anybody got any other thoughts? They're not necessarily about recovery, but I know you're all in really different contexts of where this conversation might be taking you. Wendy Palmer? So um, certainly we're not in recovery, but um, you know, our focus is adults um, with disabilities. And the thoughts that I've had when I think about a, a large body of support workers and, and how to frame this for them, um, you know, I had a sense that there's there's that level of understanding that they need. Um, you know, when we talked about, um, you know, life is a series of discoveries and it's not just about the successes, which is where, you know, support staff are often encouraged to, you know, have successes with clients, you know, move forward. It's not just the learning and the successes, it's also, you know, in the failures and the disappointments and that for, for people to feel really comfortable about that, like to understand their own lives and think about that in the context of the lives of the people that they're supporting. And so from that understanding, I guess I had a sense of not wanting to focus, to, to move people away of looking at meaning and purpose as like a task that they needed to, or a goal they needed to achieve, and more something that they just needed to be mindful and thoughtful of right through the person's journey. Um, and that, that they're, you know, focus is in thinking about what we think the person's values are right now at this point in their life. And, you know, uh, are we putting up any barriers to them living in a congruent way with those? Um, so, yeah, I really have, where my thinking is going is about presenting it to the workforce more about being observant and easy, but actually having a deeper understanding of the process but not forcing it certainly you know personally i don't see um that people you know my own meaning and purpose is something i find myself it's not something that someone sets me a goal to find my purpose and meaning and i think that that needs to be the same for the people that we support and when we're creating service structures for large groups of staff, there is risk that when you, you pull out something like meaning and purpose that you can inadvertently um, create a task focused mindset for staff in um, implementing that. So yeah, that, that's where my thoughts have been going. Fabulous, thank you, Wendy, really helpful. Rachel? Hi, yeah, just um, following on from what both Jules and Wendy said. So part of my role is mentoring newer staff um, um, and particularly staff who maybe haven't been um, working alongside people with disabilities for a very long time and, and, and helping them, I guess, find their role in what they do. Um, and something, what, what both Jules and Wendy said sort of resonated with me because I think a lot of what I've found that um, newer staff have been struggling with is that what Wendy was saying, that task, task focused mindset of, of this idea is that we suddenly have to find this brilliant, wonderful, shining idea of a goal or purpose for someone's life. Um, and it's not necessarily about that. It's more sometimes that journey because um, we often work alongside older people who maybe have never been given the opportunity to say, well, 
what does make you want to get up in the morning? What are those things that you want to do? You know, um, some people who don't even know what places that they like to visit in their community because they've never been given the opportunity to be asked that and given the space to explore that. Um, so it seems unrealistic in those instances to say, okay, well, let's find meaning for that, help this person find meaning when this person has been given so little opportunity to experience or to seek what it is that might be some of those ingredients. So we have to really start very early on in that search in terms of, okay, well, what do they like doing and which places do they like visit, visiting before we can even start to look at, you know, we sort of have to find some of those ingredients before we can start baking this cake of meaning for someone, if that makes sense. Um, and combining that with what Jules was referring to um, in terms of that focus on the everyday and getting stuck in that funnel of, you know, so how do we keep that focus on this big picture while we are so busy with the everyday of medications or, or even just that day-to-day -day routine? So how do we create space for that? Um, and what I find a lot um, in terms of working with older clients is simply starting by creating some of those opportunities to experience those things because quite a few of the people that we work alongside have not been given that um, or have been denied that quite a lot. Um, so it's simply by starting to create those experiences because that they haven't had that chance. Fabulous, thanks Rachel. Alex, you raised your hand. Hey, yeah, so sort of along the same sort of lines. Um, I mean, I feel like we're a lot of companies, uh, a lot of the time we're always trying to take the risk out of everything. So it's like if people aren't actually allowed to make mistakes, then how are they going to get these sort of learning experiences? I think a lot of the time we're trying to sort of close people down quickly if they're sort of not showing normal sort of behaviors or normal sort of way of acting. Um, but yeah, and yet like a lot of companies, we sort of, we see like mistakes as failures rather than as a sort of learning curve for that person and then sort of take that and plan sort of make our plans around the mistakes and how can we make that better for the person? How can they achieve something better next time? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alex. Okay, any, any other thoughts? Wendy O'Beara? Um, I was just reflecting a little bit on what you were saying, Rachel and, and Bridget and um, um, Jules as well. I guess one of the things that really becomes critical in my thinking around the meaning and purpose is how can how can we affect valued roles with the people that we're actually supporting for because in essence the valued roles that they assume will then give meaning and purpose in life and some of those valued roles particularly with little ease and what Bridget I so hear what you're saying is being an ex-speechy from long 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 ago um, it is so easy to get lot for parents to get lost into therapy world and to lose sight of the fact that actually this is their son and their daughter first and foremost this is not a child with a disability that who needs to be therapized this is a child like any other child who happens to have some needs. And one of the things I always remember a parent in a conference in Brisbane shared, which basically brought the whole audience to tears, was that when her daughter was born, the medical staff basically told her to, you know, pack her bags, go home and leave the child behind. And, you know, this is significant. Oh, my goodness, everybody came in, you know, with shock horror. Um, and, you know, she actually took on board a lot of that to start off with. And it wasn't until her sister came to visit her in the hospital and walked in the door and said to her, where's my niece? And as soon as she said the words niece, mum said her whole paradigm absolutely changed completely. And all of a sudden, it wasn't the fact that she had a severely disabled child she actually had a daughter. Because if my sister's coming in saying, where's my niece? That means this child is my daughter. So 
the whole world changed for herself, for mum, and for that child and for her daughter because of that one comment that was made that shifted the paradigm. And I think sometimes we get so lost in, well, families get lost and disabled people get lost in, in being able to take on the roles that A, come naturally or B, that need to be affected or developed with them. And so consequently, the meaning and purpose is absolutely lost to their life. Because what gives us an essence of what we do at times is like, well, I've got a role, I've got 50 different roles. How many roles have the people I'm working for got? And you know, what is gonna be the most effective and valued role for them that actually they identify gives them a, a purpose and a meaning in life and that why they wanna get up in the morning and who they want to meet with. So, you know, it's very easy to, overwhelm with other bigger picture strategic plannings and life planning and futures planning and all the rest of it when you know some of it is just about going back to okay what roles does this person have in their life and how can we enhance them or how can we assist them to develop new roles okay thanks wendy so i'm really conscious we've got five minutes left so it feels um I don't know, apt that we hand over the last five minutes to you, Silvana, and it would be really good if we could do a bit of a checkout before we all leave, that's okay. So Silvana, where's this conversation taking your thinking then? Yeah, thanks, I won't need five. Uh, we've lost uh, Michael, I understand he's um, presenting something today, so he stepped out of that presentation that he's conducting, so he must have returned uh, there. Um, after a little bit over an hour. So uh, I wish that he was here to do a little bit of a recap. Um, but in terms of my, my own uh, thinking, I wanted to set myself a challenge uh, as a part of today. And that would, was sort of how, you know, how are we supporting families right now with their focus on meaning? And what ideas do I have for doing that in the future? So um, I, I, I did want to do that through the uh, citizen keys to citizenship sort of um, framework. It's um, I think um, my initial prejudices have been overcome and I, I, I feel like it is um, a, a, something that can, families could connect with um, at a very um, fundamental level, being something that might mean something to them as well. So sharing that, um, that understanding for themselves and then seeing that it's applicable for their son or daughter. So I was really leaving today's session um, with some thoughts around um, how do we have some more conversations about this in Australia. And Kate, I wanted to thank you for hosting um, this series um, for Australia. And thanks to those international guests who've joined us as well. But um, really sort of saying, let's keep this conversation going because I can, um, I'm not sure about everybody else, but it's sort of temptation in the current um, situation right now um, for different reasons, Steve, you've got austerity, well, we've got the NDIS, and it sort of seems like each of those have consumed mm -hmm. us in different ways. So creating a little bit of, you know, carving out some time and space in my day, in my week, in my year, to have some conversations around this with some colleagues, to think about these things at a little bit of a deeper level, rather than getting caught up in the day-to-day -day of an organisation, the business, as we are now in the NDIS, we're businesses. Uh, we have to earn money, Steve. That's uh, <laughs> that's how we stay afloat now in Australia. <laughs> we have to earn money. And, um, and, you know, in a business to sort of keep creating space for meeting people like yourselves and, and in forums like this to have that conversation. At, at a practical level, I'll be talking to the peer workers in, um, in this organisation and they're all parents of little children, uh, birth to eight. And um, I'll be asked, I think I'll, I'll schedule a couple of times to just say, let's talk about how we can um, make the keys to citizenship uh, real for us here in this organisation. And Kate, your organisation, Avivo, um, did some work with your staff, which I thought was fascinating. So um, I thought that's another interesting idea is how do we get the therapists and teachers in our organization as well as the peer workers to start thinking about this your example was a very concrete one give them the keys to citizenship experience and um, help them to to think through what that framework means for them and hopefully uh, through that demonstrate how 
this could be relevant for the families that they're working with and the children that they're working with. So that's what I'll, I'll take, take away from today. I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a few uh, things in terms of this topic and the perspective of what it means for families of very little children. Fabulous. Thank you, Silvana. So we're just coming up to the close. So we normally do a bit of a checkout and I just don't want to keep people too long. Um, so um, thank you so much, Silvana. I will be thanking Michael. I'll post this film up into um, Citizen Network members Facebook page and then onto Citizen Network um, website. So if you have any other thoughts, I know after the last session, people went in and put some other thoughts on that they that had kind of percolated around a bit. So please feel free to go into the um, Facebook page and add anything that um, yeah, comes up for you over the next coming weeks. Um, so let's do a quick check out. So if we just try and stick with one word, one sentence, um, and I'll just call on people so that we can hear from everybody. So Rachel. I hate being picked first because I'm still getting my thoughts in order. Okay. Um. Steve? Yeah, I think this, the, the truth, every day matters. And people are telling us stuff all the time in, in subtle ways quite often, and we don't always hear it. Fabulous, thank you, Steve. Rachel. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I think the thing that stood out for me most was that there can be meaning even in the limitations and failures, um, and that it's all part of that journey. Fabulous, thank you. Bridget? Um, I think the thing that struck out for me today was about listening, just about listening to you guys and um, um, kind of this conversation, but also listening to the people that we support. Fabulous, thank you. Jules? Uh, oh, so much, but uh, personal, individual, but universal. Um, and I, I really like what Steve had to say, with life gets in the way, but, you know, life is the way. Fabulous. Katrina? Hello. I think what I found most interesting and what stuck with me is if we aren't living, we aren't learning. And particularly in my role, um, getting people to get out and challenge themselves to dip their toe in is um, probably most of my work. Um, but I really loved the whole meaning will align with your values. And I'm going to take that away today and start having some really robust uh, conversations with people around that. So thank you. Thanks, Katrina. D. Yeah, I've um, got so much out of this fantastic and um, some really good catchphrases, but the one I loved um, was the discover by learning. And uh, it kind of resonated me, Wendy was saying about it not being looking at the task I'm dictated. And rather looking at it essentially, I think about discovering by learning that every opportunity is there with all our individuals in our homes and our, in the community. So just seizing those opportunities and looking at how can we make that meaningful? What can we do to support and make that meaningful? Fabulous. Thank you, Dee. Anik? Uh, once again, I'll, I'll build on what Steve said. It's every, every day and every one. It's every one of us. Um, so there are many opportunities. I uh, have to keep uh, alert. Fabulous. Thanks, Anik. Mm -hmm. Wendy, Amira? Yeah, just similarly, and just find that I love the, the statement about finding meaning through the everyday. Fabulous. Bev? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, Silvana. It was really great listening to you talk today. And what I'm going to take away is actually um, acknowledging, listening, and don't ignore the signs. Thanks, Bev. Alex? Um, allowing people to be sort of true and authentic uh, and, uh, and align with their values and beliefs. Fabulous. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Stephanie? We can't hear you, Stephanie. Um, I'll, um, I've, oh. It's a little bit, a bit louder. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Yes, okay. So um, what I was thinking, um, I take a while to process um, the conversation, but my internal, everyone has an internal. And, and so I think what other people are saying around service systems, we do too, people, um, but looking past that for a deeper meaning for individuals that we're working with. Fabulous, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, and um, I'll take the last word, which is incredibly grateful and really looking forward. Thank you, Silvana. Um, like I say, I'll thank Michael as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you in a month's time. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.